Hello, welcome to this video. I have got the incredible Martin Miller here with me today, um, who is an amazing guitar player. I've been watching his channel for a, a while now, and he's an example of exactly what I talk about on my channel, which is a guy with incredible technique, but does not push it in your face. He's a guy that, you know, uses his technique at the service of the tune the melody the music and that's it's really impressed me so i was i was really shocked to see him subscribe for my channel and then he sent me a message <laughs> the other day uh, uh talking about jazz education and i thought i gotta talk to this guy so you know welcome to my channel martin it's great to have you here yeah thanks for having me yeah i was just stumbling upon your your uh why all jazz musicians sound the same video like a week ago, I was bringing my guitar to the tech and was putting that on my, and putting that on the car. I was ready to hate the video. I was clicking on this. This, this is gonna suck. And yeah, and then I found myself agreeing with like the whole video. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, I, I I it was a deliberately clickbaity, you know, title. Of yeah. course, all jazz musicians don't sound the same. I was trying to address certain tendencies in in mm -hmm. contemporary jazz, and of course, uh, the title was so clickbaity. It's uh, it's done it very well me, for me. That's for sure. Yeah, so, uh, um, so I was, I was very pleased and very surprised when you messaged me, and I would love to get into that. Um, what you messaged me about, so you know, far away, we'll have a discussion about it. Yeah. So, so what I mentioned to you is, is I think that a lot of the videos you made resonated with me because I said I was traumatized by music college. I was being a bit dramatic there, of course, but. Um, I guess your point in your your overarching point, there was a lot of points you made. Your overarching point in your video uh, was that the the intellectualization and the the academic academic nature of nowadays jazz education world is what homogenizes musicians across the board. And this is something I definitely feel like I've experienced in my college years. Um, to give you a quick anecdote, um, I was at the time, so I'm a, I'm a rock kid, yeah, by nature. I'm a, I'm a rock guitar player. And I was suddenly finding myself in all these ensembles, jazz ensembles. And at the time, I was really getting into Mike Stern because I feel like he was, for me, a good gateway drug into the world of jazz uh, because he has this huge rock influence. So I was, I was hauling around my chorus pedal into any of the rehearsals of the, the jazz bands. And again, the teachers would tell me to turn it off. You know, there was no room for experimentation, even though those were, this was not like a big band ensemble with, with written charts or anything. This was, here's jazz standard, let's play it, let's see what happens. But the let's see what happens is, is, is very prescriptive, very narrow in its nature, right? We don't really see what happens because we expect this to be a very specific result, which is kind of ironic if you uh, think of the nature of what jazz music is all about. And when you said it was traumatizing, which I know is a, a little bit of an exaggeration yeah. and a, a humorous comment, but, but um, how did that affect you being in that environment? Mentioning the, the word environment is key here. It was not not just the the educational system itself that i found very constricting it's also the community that that attracted like i was literally the only kid with with long hair and a charvel super strat you know <laughs> that's what i was playing at the time that's how i looked and i felt really out of place which is kind of funny because i felt like an outcast through most of most of high school because I, I was the only musically interested person in my entire school year, basically, deeply interested. So I was feeling like an outcast there. And I was, I was totally expecting for that to change the moment I entered music college. I was like, oh, this, this is just going to be a bunch of like-minded people. But it was the, the opposite was the case. Those people were from a much different background. Most of them were horn players, piano players with a very deep-rooted, traditional jazz background. And... I felt like I was changing. I, I was not staying true to my own identity in order to appeal to that group of people. For instance, when they would ask me, when other guitar players would ask me who my favorite guitar players are, I was not answering. Oh, I'm, I like Paul Gilbert and John Petrucci. I had, I felt like I need to, oh, I'm a really big George Benson fan. Yeah, that's what I'm into right now. 
And I love, 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 love George Benson. But at the time, I was not being genuine. I was, I was, I was not true to myself. I was people pleasing to fit into the into the mold of the jazz college world because I felt like I, I didn't. Whenever, whenever I would show up with with, I had a had a Laney tube amp. Whenever I sh would show up with that to rehearsal. Then the other guitarist would <laughs> would like scoff at me and do these types of things, you know. It, it, it's fascinating. This is because I think you're you're exposing my fundamental point, which is when I check out your music, and I am a big fan because I it's it's musical, and what you're doing is at the service of the music, and I can hear all sorts of different influences in there. I can hear jazz, I can hear progressive metal, I can hear progressive rock. It, jazz harmony classical harmony there's a whole ton of influences and and very important for me the blues as well you've you've got a very strong feel for the blues all those things are in there but the jazz world will then go well this guy's not jazz because they will police it and not allow that stuff in now a, a lot That's of the a lot of the criticism against me has been well if you if you checked out like louis cole if you checked out like um you know, J.D. Beck Domi and Robert Glasper. And I, yeah, I have, and I love them. But the thing is with them, that's an example of the problem because they're bringing in hip hop influences or EDM in influences. The jazz world are sort of like, well, is this jazz? I don't know. If you start bringing progressive metal in it, you know, Steve Vai, Paul Gilbert, you know, thrash metal, any of these things in, they're going to put the doors up straight away. So uh, a, a guy like you, has had to find another way through. And what's fascinating with you is is that you have in, you've done this yourself, haven't you? Through YouTube and the internet, you you haven't been signed and gone that route. You've you've been able to do it in this new world we live in, and get your music out there. It's incredible. I've been looking at the subscribers you've got and the views, and you're out on tour now, aren't you? In Germany, in a couple of days, you've got an incredible band. I love your drummer, fantastic drummer great bass player you know so you, you've been able to do this but you're having to operate outside the mainstream in a way because the jazz world is not going to go check out these new musicians coming out because of the influences are too wide it's, th that's very interesting two points with that the first one being i remember we had a pat metheny seminar for a semester but we just have a, like a weekly lesson on pat metheny's music and discuss the history the, the compositions the cultural impact, etc. And it, there was this, it was led by this teacher. And at one point, we got to the, the trio records era, in the early, late 90s, early 2000s. And the, the teacher, who's a trombone player, uh, was arguing, was starting to argue that Pat Metheny is not bebop, even if he's playing a bebop tune. So he would play like something like Solar. And he would argue, oh, that's not bebop because he's not using the bebop repertoire. And that sparked like a huge discussion among the class. The thing is, that who the who the hell cares that it's not bebop? It's Pat Metheny being Pat Metheny. It, it would be if you read any Pat Metheny interview ever, and he'll state that his prime goal is to be original, even within the space of a traditional style of music. So that to me is very symptomatic of the mindset that the music college has because the, the moment they say this is not bebop this it is it is a statement of quality because they don't mean it's it's not bebop it's something else that's equally as good because they, they really do imply it's not good enough to be bebop that's how i feel about it so that's the first thing and you mentioning artists like louis cole or take cory wong or take snarky puppy dirty loops wherever you want they don't consider themselves jazz. In fact, whenever they mention in an interview that that they're jazz influenced, they kind of shrug away from it. Yeah, I'm doing a little bit jazz, but it's not not really. Sorry, it's it's like all, they're almost apologetic about it for being jazz. And to me, that is horrible because these guys and girls are young, they're hip, they're innovative, and jazz should be proud to welcome them into their circles. Instead, they reject them, and therefore, a young person won't ever get into jazz and will never go back to Charlie Parker because they never received that gateway drug. So that's number one. <laughs> that, number that, two is, is that, yeah, sorry, sorry. 
Well, I, was, I just wanted to say that it's really, really interesting, and I've tried to make this point because I didn't on the original video, that if you take the lineage of Charlie Parker, you have Charlie Parker, and then you have Ornette Coleman, and Ol Ornette Coleman is like a complete break from Charlie Parker, but he's playing alto, and there's Charlie Parkerisms in there, and then Pat Metheny is a post-Ornette Coleman soloist. It's like the Beatles and Ornette Coleman mixed together, so when he plays a jazz standard he's approaching it with a different harmonic system which is evolved beyond bebop your teachers don't it's the ornick coleman influence they don't like because he's not playing the changes with with the bebop language all right mm. now if we take the other thing you get you, you can say have ornick coleman coltrane alan holdsworth and alan holdsworth is, is has come out of coltrane as an influence and he has then influenced guitar players especially metal guitarists Eddie Van Halen. And so when we look at the jazz, I, I love jazz because I can see when, when Eddie Van Halen's tapping, he is trying to emulate Holdsworth and the Holdsworth is trying to emulate Coltrane. So there's this line through. And I think for a long time, jazz accepted that process, but it no longer seems to accept that process. So it, it, it won't, it doesn't want to own exactly what you said. It doesn't want to own what's happening. Um, the same thing happens in progressive rock because I actually this, I work in progressive rock. You know, I was in a two, I was in IQ and I was in Frost, um, and um, the same thing happens there because when I looked at your stuff, I thought this is amazing. You're progressive rock, and I'm in the progressive rock, and yet no one has talked about you in the progressive rock world at all, and I'm right in the middle of it. So I thought that's really interesting because what you're doing is. It has got that influence in buckets but of course that world will not let you in as well because these two genres have, have become well stale and codified you know um how, how do you feel like about being called a progressive rock musician <laughs> i love it i love prog it's for me it's a it's a badge of honor to be to be doing something in that tradition um yeah i'm a huge prog rock fan i guess for the for for some elite progress i'm a bit too poppy a bit too nice <laughs> or for the it's actually i think the the biggest struggle i have with my music is whether to define it as rock or metal because i think it falls right through the grip between the two so i decided to call it progressive heavy rock <laughs> <laughs> there's i i love the harmony in there and i love the the, the melody and the rhythm it's you 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 seem to be you it, it there's a pat metheny influence there. i think pat metheny brought that back into jazz and jazz fusion this sort of beautiful harmonic setting melody and i i feel that you're doing that i and i also love your guitar tones i think you don't just go for that standard heavy metal guitar tone you know there's uh all sorts of different things um and i, and I can take a strong blues influence is that is that the case i've been i've been super heavily influenced by a lot of the modern uh blues greats like i've i've played with josh smith um i've been been huge hugely into guys like philip says joe bonamassa uh there's a guy from la who's a brazilian called art menaces he's fantastic like these this this new school of blues players is a huge influence on me and yeah and i've i've, I've already had i like i have a british blues rock background from younger years as well yeah but yeah so what, it's, it's so what got you into ongoing. playing the guitar and what got you into music how did you start it was my father I think, and my possibly my cousin. They were both huge music lovers, hobby musicians themselves. Um, but my my father had a had a huge record collection, and I got really early on. I got into the Rolling Stones um, shortly after that, and that is in single digit years. I, I got into Pink Floyd, um, then got into heavier music. I, I got really into Nirvana in the early nineties. Got into Metallica, then got into progressive metal. And then my cousin uh, gave me a Pat Metheny DVD, Imaginary Day. I think that was around 99, 2000. And that was the gateway into jazz. The, f the irony is that I was already playing jazz in conservatory at the time, but I hated it <laughs> <laughs> because I had not received that gateway drug. Yeah. That got me into it. I didn't understand the music. It, it meant nothing to me at the time. I, I, I really feel that... Um... For the last say 30 or 40 years any musician i've met it's usually heavy metal that 
brought them into the music it, that was the case for me i'm older than you i i sort of started playing the drums at the new wave of british heavy metal so it'd be iron maiden diamond head those types of bands um and i had such an interest in music and i did the same thing i went from sort of new age of Brit british heavy metal to sort of classic led zeppelin black sabbath then on to sort of um progressive rock yes genesis and then i heard john mclaughlin mavish Orchestra, and that just changed my life you know and I, I i went from there to miles coltrane and became a huge jazz fan so the the the, the gateway in for the jazz worlds and this is all over the world are, are um heavy metal musicians you know and uh I, I work every now and then with a fusion guitarist from new york called bd lens a fantastic player and he started off as a rush fan and so you've got musicians coming up and i teach these guys and i'm sure you teach them and and they start to develop an interest in jazz but i feel that there's a, a wall that they they can't get over because i feel that they they've sort of been told that these blues influences and metal influences and technical influences they're not allowed to come into that jazz world and so musicians sit there feeling sort of um and this is the thing i found really interesting when you said about being traumatized i think what actually happens is they go well i'm into all this this is what i love and i and i do really like this jazz but i'm not allowed to bring in these things that i love into it and i thought i could you know and there's so many people saying oh you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't do this and um and i also think this idea of playing through chord changes as well um i i think it's a bit of a it's, it's used as a stick to beat musicians you know I, I i've always felt that yeah it's hard to play through chord changes but it's also really hard to play a steve Vai tune as well <laughs> i mean you know they're they're both really hard to do and there should be respect both ways and there doesn't seem to be i think in education the teachers will use the chord changes to go well you think you're good it's to beat down the musicians did you feel that at music college at all one million percent I, I'll, I, I'll go even earlier than that I, I've, I felt that in conservatory so conservatory in germany is not like 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 college it's like a yep. pre-college thing that i went to and my teacher at the time was very was a very good teacher in many ways he got me really into ear training got me really into harmony it's good that those were great things but he was not much of a chops player and when i suddenly started getting into john petrucci and steve morse and i started i started shedding at home for real and I, every week i would come in with new chops to play he would get really insecure about that and and he started down talking that oh, oh that's not real you know for example i i just discovered ingrid malmstein i was like holy shit have you heard this guy ingrid malmstein and he was like yeah he's good but you know what can he stick can he play i got rhythm <laughs> that's that's always this this stupid ass attitude but can he do this this is such a european music college attitude to have is to focus so much on what somebody can do as opposed to focusing on somebody's strength that's a general uh, um uh an attitude of life that i absolutely reject i like to focus on people's strengths i don't care if bb king can play an ingrid mamson tune i don't care if bb king can play i got rhythm but what was my point? Anyway, he got really insecure about that. He was down talking that. And whenever I started, you know, I started doing these alternate picked arpeggios like Steve Morse. Whenever I tried to 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 incorporate that into a jazz improvisation, he would beat it down at the at the seams. You know, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? I I you know we're in a channel where I talk about jazz fusion. And there's a couple of guitarists that the ones that come to mind would be um, Jeff Beck. Another mm -hmm. would be um, Tommy Bowling, who played on Spectrum, Billy Cobham. And people are always going, I've done it as well. I go, these aren't, these aren't jazz guys. And you think, why aren't they jazz guys? You know, Jeff Beck is, Jeff Beck's contribution to jazz is absolutely huge. He's one of the biggest selling jazz fusion artists. And of mm -hmm. course, jazz fusion is always, they don't need, they're not even comfortable with that. So you get this sort of snobbery, you know, well, they're playing fusion, but that guy, he, I know he can play the changes, and I've alluded to this. There's an incredible interview between Herbie Hancock and Winton Marsalis, and, and Win Winton's so upset because Herbie's making pop records, but he knows Herbie can play yeah. the changes. You know, he can play all that bebop stuff, and it, you can see he's conflicted. But I've thought of God, how do we open up jazz like it was in the seventies, so guys like Tommy Bolin and Jeff Beck could 
enter into it because at the moment if you haven't got that language you're not going to be let in are you and i i I don't think it's right. And when you look at the innovations of modal playing and you look at Ornette Coleman's more free approach, the groundwork's been done. It should have been freed up for rock musicians to to gain access to it. And I, the, the amount of guitar players I know that are frustrated because they can't nail that. I, I, I've, I've spent most of my life trying to get through, because I play a bit of guitar, and I've been trying to get through Giant Steps for about 20 years. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And I've learnt a lot doing it, you know, and if, if it's like 70 BPM, I've, I've got a chance, you know. <laughs> but, uh... it's, it's, it's that those skills are absolutely overstated, especially yeah. in the music college world. I was I was once sitting down with a saxophone teacher in, in the cantina and I was I was telling him, you know, I, I can't play cold train changes, nor do I care that I can't. And he was saying to me, well, if you go to if you go to the university in Amsterdam or Rotterdam, uh, it is mandatory to do Coltrane changes in your second year. And, like, and I'm just thinking, what, why is that net? Why is that important for a guitar player to be able to do that? Because I can tell you that 99% of the guitar players I like cannot do that. And it's completely irre it's a completely irre yep. irrelevant skill. And I can also guarantee you that 99% of the people who can play that in their second year can't play a decent rhythm guitar to save their lives. So that's an interesting aspect. I feel like that's a place where jazz education is extremely removed from reality, um, especially in the guitar world. Now, what was the initial question? Um, changes playing. With that said, it's, I, 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 I do believe that the reason people push the changes playing aspect is because I do believe that, that they think you need to kind of earn your right to be a part of the tribe. That's exactly at it. At least to a degree. And I, 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 do actually, I, I, I am that conservative that I would, uh, that I would say, you do, you, you do need to validate your entry ticket to a degree at least. You need to understand the tradition a little bit before you can delve into it. Otherwise, anybody could, could now, now imagine your vision is around the around the corner, right? Somebody would like appropriate the blues who has never heard a blues record in their life because they claim to be blues. So I, I I do think there is a there is a level of gatekeeping that is he considered healthy. Yeah, I agree I know with that. For myself, that I'm very grateful that I received lessons in playing over chord changes because it it informed my rock soloing hugely. And I I do this in all my workshops and clinics nowadays. I talk about how I play over simple changes like you two with or with or without you. You know the the most tired chord progression in all of human history. But I, I treat that as jazz changes. And that that largely informs my style, my personal style. I do not play in the key center, I play over the changes. That is something that I'm very grateful for. I, I think there's there's two things um, in terms of music education, jazz education that are really important. One of them is not playing the changes, playing a pentatonic blues scale and learning to phrase with those five notes and also learn to get decent vibrato and decent bend. This is what I'm really seeing with my students is guys are coming in, they're obsessed with jazz and you know, they've listened to that. They, they see that as a, a, a thing that's tormenting them because they can't do it. And then they listen to a lot of modern metal players. And, and I'm saying, if you just get your um, uh, vibrato and bend sorted out, you know, it's, I, it's, I always argue that if you improve your vibrato, your playing to gets 10% better. Yeah, because let's say you average on a on, on a vibrato on every tenth note. If you're going to make every tenth note sound better, that is an effective ten percent improvement of your playing. Which is, of course, it's a bit it's a bit of a shallow comparison, but yeah, that's and, and definitely the other thing, a point for me. Yeah, the other thing with, with vibrato is that um, uh, it, it that there's a point where you can show your personality because you know Dave Gilmore's vibrato is different to BB King's, which is different to Carlos Santana's. That that the your individuality is. Um, that's where you could build your individuality. But the other thing is, I think that this idea of simply looking at the chords, because that you're basically learning the building blocks of music, you know, you've got chords and they create melody. That's basically what it is. So I, I do agree to some extent, but I, I would like musicians to, uh, you know, if, if the message could get out that they're allowed to do it in the way they want to do it, because um, the, the, the thing that really impressed me just before Chick Corea died, is he started to do some educational 
videos online and I thought they were fantastic because he said, well, this is my approach to soloing. He said, I might play this. And he played something on the piano. Then he goes, I think, do I like that? And if I like it, I keep it. <laughs> and I don't think that message about your own personal taste, and this this is the argument about individuality. How do you feel about that in your own playing and what have you done to try and develop your own voice? Because I, I, there's definitely your own voice there. Yeah, so I don't know. My 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 elevator pitch for myself would be, you know, what what if what if John Petrucci had a jazz degree? That's kind of where my where I feel my playing is like. I I love the aesthetic and the sound of that type of progressive rock and metal playing. But I try to to pair it with like a pinch of extra uh, sophistication. I get Pat Metheny is one of my top three influences of all time. Um, I, I the the irony is I think that that as much as the, the the jazz education tries to homogenize musicians, I think with with me it worked out pretty well in the end mm. because I, I was stubborn enough to to stick to my guns, and and I brought what I learned from college into what I was doing initially, although that was a completely self taught process. Bridging that gap was self taught. I was not assisted in college. If anything, whenever Whenever I was writing writing a piece of music and I would show it to one of my teachers, they would oftentimes go, "Yeah, you, you know, it's a nice melody, but but what, 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 why do you use that disco rhythm on the drums?" And I was like, "Yeah, because the disco rhythm is the only thing that makes it different from everything else." <laughs> yeah, it, so it, it keeps coming back to the same thing: is there's there's a door, and they're not letting anything in that's not jazz. That is fundamentally my point. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen in jazz, but there's definitely a very, very strong thing. And anybody who's involved in education will be aware of it. Um, and that makes and, it systemic. That's a yeah. systemic issue right there. To totally. That, that, this, this is a fascinating discussion for me. Um, what did you learn? So people who are watching this that like prog rock, progressive metal, and all those styles, and they're dipping their toe into jazz, and I'm trying to get them beyond that snobbery thing where they go no i'm going to check this out not and then can i listen to like steve lukather is that jazz well yeah yeah it's it, it's it, yeah you know and where the jazz will go no no that's the wrong guy he's got to listen to wes montgomery <laughs> you know uh, so so what did you learn yourself you've this journey to get where you are and you've been very successful created a great big fan base for your music what what was the things you learned um outside of the college or inside? Outside, yeah, that you found out yourself. When you went on that sort of self-exploration of how to bring these influences in, what what was the things you learned? It's it's kind of, you know how they say when you go to driving school, you don't learn how to drive until you're out of driving school? For me, that was kind of the same thing. I was only learning to play proper post-college when I was actually, you know, getting to gigs and standing on my own feet. Um. What have I learned? That's a good question. I mean, fairly recently, you know, I haven't I haven't released an album in ten years until recently, right? Until mm -hmm. last month, I've learned fairly recent recently that I, I I can write songs with vocals and choruses and hooks, um, and I've learned fairly recently that I can also sing and that I can produce and I could do all these things together and I cr can create music that way. That for me is a fairly new discovery, and I feel like if as long as I would have been tied to college, I would not have, have a, like I wouldn't have not have been allowed in some way to do those things because I first had to figure out the giant steps changes instead of becoming yeah. like I, I want to be a rock star, you know, but I was suppressing I, I did there was a need that I didn't know I even had. You know, I like to be a front man who plays guitar and sings. So, so where did you start singing? Because that was the thing that blew me away because, you know, there's great guitarists. Uh, and then there's great guitarists who can sing, and they're like hen's teeth, aren't they, really? So, um, you know, do you tell you weren't singing from day one? Was it something you thought, well, I'll try, and then... Because you're a fantastic yeah, seven, singer. I started singing seven years ago. And, uh, ah, that's mad! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I took I took a bunch of singing lessons, and I ended up with, with classical singing lessons, uh, bel canto technique, that really helped. Although, in order to achieve the sound that I do achieve, I have to break those rules all the time, which ties kind of back in because the, the the rules of the classical world, as you know, are hyper, hyper strict. And yeah, I, I break them all the time in order to be able to to sing. Well, that, that, well you've, you've, you've raised another really important point that I never made is that 
perhaps you need to study the rules because the only way you can innovate is to know how to break those rules. Yes, and that's why I do think it's beneficial to to learn to play over chord changes, even if you're not going to do it. Because yeah. it should be, ideally, it should be a conscious artistic decision not to do it instead of the, the lack of an option. You know? Well, I, I've taught a little bit of jazz guitar to various students, and the things that I've found really help them, as well as learning pentatonic and learning to be able to phrase with the pentatonic scale, is I will play them a chord they don't know that chord and I'll ask them to play any note and try and recognize what that note is and not judge that note so that they get the confidence to feel that they can make any note work because phrasing will make notes work. Um, but also if the note is wrong, they, they're aware of what it is. They go, oh my God, it should be a third and I've just played a flat third. So I need to move up a semitone or whatever. But, but I felt found that that idea of removing judgment from what you're doing uh, the, it, you, you have to know the rules to do it i think ear training is very important with this as well um yeah, if, imagine imagine a, a child were or a toddler were to learn how to walk and would, would make its first attempt to walk and would, would stumble and you'd be like no 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 you're stumbling man you got to keep the balance man you got to get it you got to stay straight and put one foot forward after the other you cannot do that you cannot be like at the first wrong note, be like, no, nah, that's wrong. That's wrong. You, can't, you cannot play this. This is not making the changes. It's, 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 you need to allow the mistakes. Every mistake is an opportunity for improvement. And, and by trying to suppress these mistakes, what, what is even a mistake? A mistake is some, is, is if your, your expectation and the end result are misaligned, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like also when, like on the guitar specifically, when discovering the fretboard, like I want to explore certain positions, find certain notes. I find it very, this is especially a thing with adult students, what that holds them back from learning is that they're too judgmental about how something sounds. It doesn't matter how something sounds. You're just looking for the notes or, or I tell them, here's the chord tones. Here's the chord progression. Play only using the root, the third and the fifth. See what happens and say, so, yeah, but it doesn't sound musical. It doesn't sound music. Doesn't matter if it sounds musical. Just play the right note. Just learn where the notes are, and later on put them together. Like it's the same with singing. In singing, you you oftentimes make functional sounds like, and that connects the different registers of your voice. Imagine you have this attitude, but that that sounds horrible. What are my neighbors going to think? And what is anybody going to think? You're, you're, you're trying to skip to the end of the line, which is the final product. And that's, that's not a good place to be when you're, when you're learning and exploring. Well, the, when I checked out your channel, I remember I watched you play and then I came across a video where some student was asking you how to play fast. And he oh, was yeah. saying, I'm, pl I'm playing it really slow and, and accurately. And you said that that won't work. That won't work. That you've got to, to play fast. The first thing is to attempt to play fast, really scrappily. You know, mm -hmm. to, to, to get the feeling of what it would be like to play fast and then your body will refine those movements. And I thought this guy really knows what he's talking about. A great musician and he really knows what he's talking about. But to do that, you have to put it with it sounding awful <laughs> for, for a long time and, and just persevere at it. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I found that fascinating that you made that point. And I'm, I wanted to make that point again. Anyone watching this video, if you do want to play fast, you know, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, you know what, what one of the most common remarks under that video is, is like something, oh man, playing fast is easy, anybody can do it, you should be playing with feeling instead, and, or, or, I, or you shouldn't be worrying about playing fast that comes by itself. For, well, first of all, it does not come by itself, period. Second of all, it doesn't matter if you should or should not be playing fast. Here's a student who comes to me for lessons and he asks me how he can increase speed. And that's all I'm showing. I'm not being judgmental. I'm not trying to make the same mistakes that my educator yeah. made by educating me on the on the on the whether I should or should not. It's the same with it's like where's the flat nine on on for, on the on the C chord? Oh, you shouldn't be playing flat nines. Um, it's it's it, I just try to deliver accurate information, and I I want the the artist that's learning from me to be the judge of what they want to do with it or not. You know? And also, I'm not teaching him how to play accurately. I'm literally just answering the question, how do I get yeah. faster? How do you do it? Period. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, 
my take on this is that there's loud music there's quiet music there is um uh, music with lots of high notes lots of no notes and then there's bits with a uh, fast and they're slow and if you want to set something to sound great when it's slow it's very often great to contrast against something fast so you're basically it's like saying to a painter um, you can use all the colors but you shouldn't use red because red's a bad color it's a color in the music and what's really interesting is the gatekeepers will allow certain musicians to play fast and in the jazz yeah. world, that's the case nobody minds art tatum or coltrane playing fast you know but as soon as the ingvi malmstein is playing fast then is a big problem I'm, I'm currently playing with a guitarist called roy marchbank and he mm. he probably is the fastest guitarist in the world and um he is just receives flack continually and it's almost like a curse to him um he became very interesting guitar he, he became interested in world music sarud playing and flamenco playing and he applied those techniques and he's he's got this incredible facility at, at, at playing fast um, and I said, what, what, why did you do that? And it, he's interested in that Coltrane thing that um, the way to sort of voice a scale, if you want to have the feeling of a scale, you're going to have to play a lot of notes, aren't you, to to get that harmonic. And I I like the sound of that. That's a sound I like. And yet there's a people going around saying, oh, no, that's bad. We don't like that sound. It's it's prejudicial. Like I find it's, it. The worst thing, it's almost it's almost to the degree of gaslighting where they would tell somebody that they're not playing with feeling to which my response is, oh, how do you know what I'm feeling? And and even and even worse. So like, let's talk about feeling for a second. I don't know. I don't have much time left, but I, I want to get this point across. I do not believe that music has any feeling whatsoever. Music cannot have any feeling. Music is just vibration egg air molecules <laughs> yeah it's it's moving air the the feeling is what what is the the result in the listener receiving those vibrations the feeling exists within each and every listener and that is a highly subjective experience and somebody it's it comes boils down to taste somebody might find something a certain thing like a, a lot of people praise Ingve Malmsteen for having incredible amounts of fire in his playing without a doubt. You know, incredible amounts of expression that is a form of feeling to them other people are not recipient to that kind of emotion and they only for example the blues elitists would only equate emotion to a feeling of sadness something rather melodramatic or pain mm. those types of emotions it's a different it's a different type of emotion but it's not inherent within the music it's inherent within the listener well, as we could see, we're back. We're down to the last minute of my Zoom call, and uh, this has just flown. I really enjoyed it, and I love your music, and uh, I love what you're doing, and such an intelligent approach. And I'm so, I'm so glad we've uh, hooked up, and I'm hoping we can do more of this and keep in touch, and our paths will cross again in the future at some point. Absolutely. Uh, lovely to have you on my channel. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. And everybody, go and check this guy out if you haven't seen him. You'll find him. He's on YouTube. He's my. He's like. He's the the biggest subscriber to my channel on YouTube. This guy is. <laughs> You're right. So uh, he's a very important person. So you know, you know. Thanks for thanks for doing this for me. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks so much.